remotely close to the local cells. So today I want to see another aspect of the local assembly. It is a place of worship. A place of worship. Man is unique. Because man alone, of all of God's creation, displays the inclination, the desire, I would say even the need to worship. What do we worship? What does man worship? Oh, we can just, uh, I'm sure a few things go through our mind. Man worships pleasure. We can look at the temples and the stones of pleasure that are around. Man worships power. Power is so seductive. <laughs> a friend of mine, he got the job in a very, a very high, uh, in a very high position. And I told him, wow, congratulations. He must have received a uh, big pay rise. He said, no. He said, yes, I didn't get a pay rise. But John, what I love about my new job is the power. It's the power I have. They can cut my salary. I can, I, I'm, I'll be okay with that. But this power, I want to keep it present. You see that happening in the world today. You see what's happening in Russia and Ukraine today. Is that worship of power. Fame. Man loves fame. Who doesn't? Money. All that comes with it. The BBC had an interesting little article uh, and uh, it was talking about how religion had um, was no longer held the position it held in British society and the conclusion of the article was this. Money is today's society's religion, and its economists are its students. And it went on to talk about the temples of money there in the UK. Don't worry, what happens there will be here, it is not here already. But we don't stop at worshipping these things, do we? We go beyond and overboard to get more of these things that we worship. We will kill, we will maim, we will cheat, we will lie, we will destroy anything that stands between us and what we worship. When we look at the first murder in the Bible, it had to do with worship. Cain murders. Able, kills it. It had to do We look through history, whether it's the Crusades of the past, or the Islamic jihadists of today, or the armies of mighty nations, the powerful drug cartels, the business syndicates. It's all tied in. It's all because of what people worship. People, someone put it like this, people will worship anything they well want to worship, anything but God. That is so true. In Romans chapter 1 we read that the apostle says that man ends up worshipping vain idols, heavenly objects, cre creatures. We end up even worshipping ourselves and our desires. Oh, I have been in conversation with people. I remember talking to a taxi driver in the UK a long time ago when he heard we were from the US. He, he was under the impression or he, his understanding was that here we did not care about the environment. And he went on about the environment, how important it was. And it was like, you know, it was someone sharing the gospel. <laughs> he was so passionate. He was so, he meant so much to me. Obviously, he worshipped the environment. So what is worship? Worship, the root word, comes from the old English word meaning, the old English word is the word meaning worthy or honorable. And the suffix ship 
is the state of what comes before it. In other words, worship means the state of being worthy. The state of being worthy. Is anyone here or does anyone here consider themselves to be in a state of being worthy? Are you? Am I? When tempted in the wilderness, the Lord Jesus made it clear that God alone should be worshipped. Why? Because He alone is in a state of being worthy. And this should be our way of life. Worshipping one who is in a state of worth. And that should be our state. Now, worship is determined by faith and obedience. Our worship of money is because we have faith in money. Faith that money will give us what we want. And an obedience to certain rules that will allow us to get more money, invest here, take certain risks, and I'm going to get more of this thing that I worship. So I have faith that I will get some, that this money will give me what I want in life. And I'm going to go in obedience based on the uh, market rules or whatever it may be to get more of this. And that is for us as Christians. Our worship is determined by our faith in God and our obedience to what God has revealed to us. Now, where is our place of worship? Where is our place of worship? Now, there are so many places, so-called places of worship, yes? Churches, other religions have their places of worship. You can go to homes and see places of worship. I don't know if any of you have been into Hindu homes, but in some Hindu homes, they'll have a prayer room. And in this prayer room, they'll have their idols. They'll have their incense and the candles. So outside this room, it's like any perfect, any normal room. But now you go into the prayer room, you're somewhere else. And there are other people who will have their places where they'll maybe display their wealth and all the things they have, or whatever it is that is important to them, or their fame. And God does have a place on earth for his people to worship. He has a sanctuary. And a sanctuary is a structure set aside for God. And it is a holy, it is holy. In fact, in, uh, in Hebrews, heaven itself is called a sanctuary. Because that is where God is, and that is where God will be worshipped one day. But what about a sanctuary on earth? Yes, God does have a sanctuary on earth. We read here in uh, God's sanctuary on earth, in Hebrews 9.1, Then verily the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. And what was this worldly sanctuary? For there was a tabernacle made. So there was a sanctuary, a place of worship, the tabernacle in the wilderness. And the next few verses there in Hebrews, Hebrews 9, we see the pattern given by God to Moses for this tabernacle. Then we carry on, we come to a few more books, and we read here read of another sanctuary on earth, Solomon's temple. The pattern for the temple was given by God to Mo to David, and David passed it on to Solomon. What is our sanctuary today? What is our place? Of worship. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
The sanctuary, the temple, the tabernacle is no longer physical. It is no longer these uh, walls here or this roof. It is a spiritual house built up of all believers in Christ. <coughs> it is common with it, has, it is the assembly or this sanctuary. It has this thing in common with the tabernacle or the, or the uh, temple. God fills the place up. God filled up the tabernacle. And you see in the temple as well. It is his dwelling place on earth. The tabernacle was God's dwelling place on earth. The temple was God's dwelling place on earth. And today's God's dwelling place is not a building. It is not a physical, tangible, tangible building. It is a structure. A structure made of living stones. And living rocks. The other day I was driving back from Stillwater and I was, it was late at night, and I was listening to the radio and I, there was a dramatized uh, story of the conversion of George Muller. He says how he went to a Bible study uh, and uh, he didn't want, uh, he went with a friend, his friend did not even want to take it, but he said, I want to come. Uh, so he went, and the people there prayed, and they sang songs, and there was a message. He doesn't remember much of any of those. But there's one thing that stuck with him. He said, these people knew their Jesus. To these people, their Christ was as real as the person sitting next to them. And it stayed with him. And that is what led to his conversion. Not the songs they sang or, the, or even the message of the preacher. But this was reality. That this was the living Christ. The someone, someone with whom I could have a personal relationship. And that's what the assembly is. We are a spiritual house. And now we are not going through rituals or through a sequence of services. It is someone who is real in us, with us, for us. And here we see that believers, so not, not only are we living stones, a spiritual fellowship, but we are holy priests. We are priests. Under the Mosaic law, law, the priesthood was limited to the tribe of Levi and the family of Aaron. And even those were priests who were forbidden to approach the, the presence of God, except once a year on the Day of Atonement. Only on that, the high priest would come. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And there was a clear procedure outlined in the Word of God. I digress a little bit here, but when I was reading through this and Yom Kippur, the memories of that 1973 war came back to me when uh, uh, Israel was attacked by the uh, Arab states. It's, I mean, I'm completely changing here, but a little bit of history here for, uh, for, for those of you who are younger. The, uh, the Arab nations uh, uh, attacked Israel. Uh, it was a surprise attack, and it was on the Day of Atonement. And within three days, Israel mobilized itself, and within a day, within a few days, they were at the gates of Cairo, at the, by the walls of Cairo and Damascus, so to speak. They were within a few miles of, those, of the capitals of Egypt and Syria. And then peace was made. Anyway, sorry, a bit of history. <laughs> But today we are all priests. And today all believers are priests. And we don't have access just once a year, as we know, but we have access to the throne room of God day or night. Now, what are the functions of this priest? It says to offer up spiritual sacrifices. 
to offer up spiritual sacrifices. What are some examples of these sacrifices? Slides here. I try. Okay, so living stones. Okay, now it's uh, living stones. Uh, holy priesthood offering of sacrifices, uh, spiritual sacrifice, and accepting the Lord. So, what are some of these? The presentation of our bodies as a living sacrifice. The sacrifice of our praise. The sacrifice of good works. The sacrifice of our possessions or pocketbooks. The sacrifice of service. This is not for men only. Who are these priests? We are all priests. And the question is, are we serving as priests? Are we presenting our bodies as a sacrifice, as, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God? Are we praising Him, giving thanks to His name? Are we doing good? Did we do any good last week? Are we sharing? Are we sacrificing, giving our possessions to those in need? And are we sacrificing in service? This priesthood is a privilege. This priesthood is something that's to be understood, believed, and practiced joyfully by every single person. But at the same time, we must be careful that we do not abuse this priesthood. There are certain constraints, there are certain uh, things we have to follow as in the word of God. For example, not every priest has the right to preach or teach in the assembly. So this priesthood, for example, uh, just a few examples here, uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy, the, the, the women are forbidden to teach or have authority over men. And then it says of men who speak, men who speak, of any, if any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability with God given. And so we see here any man, so there is no clergy. There is no specially qualified man here with certain degrees or whatever it is. It says any man. No laity, no clergy here. But there is a big responsibility here. You can see this. He must be sure. The speaker must be very sure that, he that the words he speaks are the very words that God would have him say on that particular occasion. And that's what it means by the oracles of God. So this is a challenge for us. We should not, it is not just enough to just preach from the Bible. We should know that, look, this is the God, this, sorry, this is the message that God intends or wants me to speak at this time. Then this one be applies to all of us. Not just men. We have gifts. Gifts that differ according to the grace trust. Let us exercise them. We have, let us make use of the gifts we have. Uh, then here is again something that again applies to all of us. Here Paul is telling Timothy, Look, God has given you a gift. Stir it up. 
make use of it for young men if, you, if god has given you the gift of speaking teaching preaching stir it up don't just sit, let this lie there go in there stir it up activate it and it's not only in relation to public speaking it applies to gifts that all of us men or women stir it up make use of it one of the sad things to see is men and, men and women gifts that God has given them. They just let it lie there. And here is it. And we, there are, we could go on like, we, we could go on, but here again is something that is uh, again talking about speaking here. So it says, how is it brethren, whenever you come together, each of you, each of you has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. What a responsibility as priests for all of us. In particular to the men when it comes to public speaking or public uh, positions of authority. It is to each of us. Paul does not, or the scriptures do not talk about a particular subgroup or a subset of people. But it also applies to, to things that are not public. It applies to men and women. This responsibility of priesthood. We truly are failing as, as we read in Peter, as a spiritual fellowship, as a spiritual building, if we fail as priests. The worldly or physical sanctuary is gone. It is now a spiritual building. And the question we should all ask is, where are the priests? I may have told this story before in an assembly in Scotland, at the remembrance meeting, it was total silence for 30, 40, whatever minutes. Finally, a woman stood up and said, Lord, open the mouths of this dumb sheep. <laughs> it's dumb priests. It's true. It's very true. <laughs> now, there is this spiritual fellowship has a visibility, it has a physical aspect to it. Although it is a spiritual building, it has a physical aspect to it. Visible. And that is the assembling, not forsaking the assembling of uh, ourselves together as a manner of Sundays, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day go, so the day approaching. So it is a spiritual fellowship, but we express it visibly when we meet together on the breaking of bread for fellowship, on the teeth for the teaching of the word of God, for the preaching of the gospel. Gathered together by the Holy Spirit, gathered to the Lord Jesus. In Thessalonians we read, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering unto him. So there is going to be a gathering unto him, a day of gathering when he comes. But there is a gathering unto him today. And here we read that that gathering. The gathering today he is not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some history. Now, so here we read that some people have stopped coming to the assembly as the manner of some or they have departed from the gathering center. Now, when you look at this chapter and you go on in Hebrews 10, you go down. It seems it's talking about apostasy or those who have turned away from Christ. Now, no one who truly knows the Lord and has been saved can ever be an apostate. So no one who is who knows the Lord is saved and loves and can truly be an apostate. But he or she can forsake 
or not come to the assembly of ourselves together. In other words, that person is imitating the actions of an apostate. So may not be an apostate, but that person is imitating the actions of an apostate. How important it is that we are able to make it every meeting of the assembly that we can come to. Sometimes we cannot. That's, that's uh, and the Lord knows that. But if other things take priority, and sometimes other things do have to take priority over coming to a meeting, sometimes things will happen and we, we have to take care of those things. But if there are, but there are other things which should, which, should be, which should be less important, and if we are not able to come to every meeting that we possibly can, that we can come to, if we cannot come, then what are we doing? We are imitating an apostle. And this verse carries on. We say, we exhort one another. We encourage each other, comfort each other, nourish each other. And this applies to all of us. Some of us may be going through difficult times, and there is a need to exhort and encourage each other so much the more as we see the day of Christ's return. And these truths will be attacked. As the day of purpose. So, God has a sanctuary. His sanctuary are his people. And we are the priests, all of us, in this sanctuary. And we worship him in this sanctuary because he only is worthy to be worshipped. And that is your and my responsibility. And when we look, and when we carry on with the um, with the um, with the early church, when we look at the early church, we see that they met on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to beg, break bread. Obviously, this is not talking about a meal because a meal uh, you you eat every day of the week, not just the first day of the week. Um, so this is talking about the breaking of bread, as in Acts chapter. 242. Um, and so at the beginning of the first day of the week, I would say that the disciples met in the earliest opportunity, opportunity that was the first thing they did, was to remember the Lord. Now, when we come to Acts 20, uh, when we carry on this in Acts 20, the sequence of events is interesting. Uh, what we see is they came to break bread, then Paul who preached that in that Acts 20, Paul preaches in Acts 20. That's when the Eutychus uh, uh, falls asleep, falls asleep and falls down. Uh, and then after that, they have a meal. So in Acts 20, we have this sequence. They, they break bread to remember the Lord. They have a message. And then they have a meal together. So that, so that is, uh, that's interesting. Now, here's something else about the... Uh, we are all familiar with these verses. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And the same, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the good testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, he will show the Lord's death until he comes. This is a revelation from the Lord to Paul. That's how he says. For I received of the Lord. The Gospels were not written yet. But he may have heard, he may have heard uh, of that day. Of that day when they met together for that last supper. He may have heard it from the disciples who were there. But Paul also had a direct revelation from the Lord as to what this meant, as to what happened on that night before the Lord Jesus went to the cross. It was the night in which he was betrayed. It was the night when the forces of darkness and evil had gathered for an assault, for an attack. And the Lord retires to the upper chamber with his disciples. 
And that is the sin. And he knew exactly what was done. We cannot understand what the emotions of the Lord were on that night. <clears throat> Only he knew what this meant. Only he knew what was happening on that night. On that dreadful night. His disciples didn't have a clue. And on that night, he institutes this memorial. This too, in remembrance of me. And he looks down, he looks ahead, he looks to the future. And he sees through century after century, people gather together and celebrate this feast. I don't know what went through his mind on that day, or through his emotions, and what he went through that day. And what is remarkable about this whole thing is this. Verse 24, when he had given thanks. What was he giving thanks for? Was he giving thanks for a meal like we would give for the nourishment we're going to get? Knowing what lay ahead of him and the cross in front of him. Was he really saying, Lord, thank you for this food? I'll, I'll feel good after eating this. I don't think so. I don't think that's what he was thanking for, thanking God for. I think he was thanking God for that his body was going to be broken for you. And <coughs> I think he was thanking God that his blood was going to be shed for us. His precious blood was going to be shed. And the Father there in heaven heard the words of thanksgiving from his son. These are things that we cannot understand, we cannot find. But he gave thanks on that day as he instituted this memorial. Where is our thanksgiving as we come together? What is our thanksgiving? We are blessed. We are honored. We are a privileged people who gave thanks. Notice here the way the apostle writes it. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed to bread, he says, the Lord Jesus. He doesn't say the, the, the Jesus, the night in which he took bread. He said, the Lord Jesus. In, uh, in John 13, we read this, you call me teacher and Lord. The disciples always called him teacher and Lord. They called him Lord. Do we have the same sense of reverence? Do we have the same sense of worthiness when we come to remember him? We are not coming to remember Jesus. We are coming to remember the Lord Jesus. It is not another Sunday. It is not another Lord's Supper. It is not another ritual. We have come to remember the Lord. Is there a sense of reverence, of awe, of fear? Knowing that he alone is to be worshipped. This too, remembrance. And then it says, and, and I, I left one verse, which was there in the previous one. We do this only until we, we proclaim the Lord's death. Until. And then here in Corinthians 10 16, you read, the cup of blessing which we bless. This is not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break. This is not the communion of the body of Christ. For we, we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. This talks about the unity. We are united in the body of Christ through this evangelist. In partaking of that one bread and that cup, we Say that we are one with every child of God. So, so this is a meeting where this the remembrance meeting. We show, we proclaim it till he come. We come in reverence and in awe, and we come united. The bread which you break is really not the person who comes in front and breaks it. It's not important. We are all breaking that bread. 
We are all breaking the bread of our own volition, acknowledging, realizing that we broke his body. We caused the sufferings. He was wounded for my transgression. It may be you or you or you or me or whoever comes and breaks it. It doesn't matter who is breaking it. It is as though I'm taking that bread and I'm breaking it into pieces. It's a picture of what he went through. Same thing when I take the cup. It's not about the person who comes and takes the cup and hands it up. It is me. A symbol of the blood that was shed. And we should be remembering. We should be remembering him at the beginning of the at the beginning of the week, at the earliest opportunity. And then there is these som somber words, where eats the bread or drinks the cup, and an unworthy man shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthy, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Not discerning the Lord's body, for this cause many are weak and sicky among them, many sick. So, before we come to take the bread, what is the condition of our heart? What is the condition of our minds as we partake of the Lord's supper? Why are we worthy to take the bread and the, uh, to partake of this supper? Because God has accepted us in the Lord Jesus. But it is possible. That we could be conditionally unworthy because of sin, certain conditions in our lives. And this applies to all of us. It says, whoever eats the bread of cup in an unworthy manner. It could be sin in our private lives, lives, it could be bitterness against one another, it could be, and it's also as in verse 29, uh, not discerning the Lord's body, not judging, not rightly judging or appreciating. What the Lord has done for us. It is, it is to dishonor the Lord, to be guilty of treating the Lord's, uh, what the Lord has done for us. So we need to self examine ourselves before we come. Sin must be confessed, repentance shown, restitution made. And that is important for each one of us. Otherwise, we bring ourselves under the judgment of God, as it's said here. When we do not fully appreciate the symbol and it is, and then the judgment is there, weak, sickly, and many sleep. Sleep means death. So these are people there in Corinth who are believers but did not appreciate what this uh, what this meant, what this remembrance meeting meant. So they were fit for heaven, but they were no longer fit for Corinth. No longer fit to be in the church. And let's look at the remembrance meeting. When we come, there is no chairman, there is no leader. Every other single meeting, whether here in this hall, whether at work or any other meeting, there is a chairman or a, or a chairperson or a chairwoman or a leader. There is a program, there is an agenda, there is no agenda. There is no program here when we come to remember the Lord. There is no leader. We don't make requests. We don't make petitions. We don't make plans for the future. We don't discuss the past or we don't even talk about ourselves. It's not about me. It's not about you. Christ is the theme. We give thanks. We remember him. His person, his work, his death, his resurrection, his return. He remembered the Father's delight in him. We sing a song, someone shares a thought. We read a scripture, there is a prayer. Some of it is audible, some of it is inaudible. You may all be having your own thoughts as you remember the Lord. But we come as one body. <clears throat> and we remember. For, for as often as he eat this bread and drink this cup, he do show the Lord's blood he he come. We go forward to that day when he will enter. So we come this morning as priests. We come to a holy sanctuary. 
we come bearing a we come bearing a sacrifice of praise for Christ. We come to remember. But this does involve preparation. It involves preparation. It requires time. It's a sacrifice. That's the word is. Sacrifice is more preparation. The holy walk, the previous walk, the previous week. Dad mentioned talk from Ecclesiastes because that's what he's been reading last week. What he read last week was was a reflection. A reflection of that was what we saw this morning. If I have not had that preparation or that time for the, the Lord last week, I have nothing to bring. On a Sunday, the holy walk, I'm not going to bed later on a Saturday night, getting prepared to come and remember the Lord. This thing, this is where we stand before God today. It is humble, very honest, but a responsible. And one day we will be held accountable. One day we will stand before God. And the question will be asked of us What did you do as a Christian? Whether you are man, whether you are male. My prayer, my hope is that I will have something to say. So, 